everyone, and welcome to this week's Invisible Not Broken. And um, I am talking to one of the most patient people who was very kind to me, even though I completely blanked on our last interview, which, um, heads up, if you are one of our interviewees, this happens. I am literally the only person on the show at the moment. We're bringing in a new co-host, but it's just me with all my dislocations and leaning into the opioid epidemic. And I do tend to forget things, so please be super patient and kind with me. So today we're talking to April Bennett, and she does have my favorite last name ever. Thank you to hey, Mr. On. Darcy. And sorry, my first name is April Dawn. April Dawn Bennett. Yes. Yes. And your last name is like one of my favorite things ever because I'm a Jane Austen freak and I like, was totally crushing on your last name. So I will stop babbling on and on. I just have one last thing to say, which is the um, nicest thing you guys can do for us if you are supporting the podcast. I deeply appreciate it. You guys are amazing. And the numbers were crazy last month. We had 7,000 downloads last month. So thank you so, so much. We don't advertise. We don't take advertisers. So you guys must be talking about us. So thank you so very much. Nicest thing you can still do to us is to head over to iTunes and I think it's Apple podcast now and just say something embarrassingly nice about us. And now April Dawn, tell me about what you were going through. The list for things I had to link through was impressive. My God, I don't even know where to start. Uh, well, we could start with your fibromyalgia, which is, I, we had so much in common. You wrote me a, a list of stuff that you're like, just your introduction email was about like uh, that long I know. or so. I, well, I am, like, like I said in there, I am very loquacious. Like I will talk and talk and talk <laughs> and talk. So at any point, feel free to tell me just shut up a minute because you have to say something. I, I will try to be like my shepherd and just sort of like shepherd the conversation over when we start going off track. But anyone who listens to this podcast knows just how fucking awful I am at staying on track. So between the two of us, we'll try to stay in the realm of illness. <laughs> Sorry, that's another bad habit is I, I tend to... As soon as I get the thought, it comes out my mouth. <laughs> this is going to be a really entertaining podcast. I apologize in advance, all of y'all. We we seem to have way too much in common, so we will do our best. Please feel free to keep listening, but let's just list off what you have so whoever's listening kind of has a general idea of where we're going to try to go with this conversation. So you have a fibromyalgia, migraines, vasovagal syncope? Vasovagal syncope. Thank you. Uh, with <laughs> Two of those diagnoses are maybe changing. Wow. We will have a long chat and fun times discussing how those diagnoses, you get like sort of like a personality, it becomes a part of you. Like this is, these are the things I have. This is part of who I am. And then all of a sudden doctor's like, hey, no. And it totally changes everything for you. So we'll get to that. Oh, so this is me. The doctors would be fine with not retesting. But I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, I never fit the diagnostic criteria for this. It was just the closest we could find. <laughs> you know, <laughs> reading through everything, years. I'm realizing you are not someone who's going to fit into any box at all. Thank you, my sister. <laughs> um, and then also bipolar and borderline personality disorder. Is that correct? Yes, with PTSD. With PTSD. Yes, my friend. Hello. <laughs> Oh, we're going to have fun. Um, so actually, let's start with the vasovagal syn- hmm, Ha, I need way more coffee. <laughs> it's okay. Basically, you know what POTS is? Mm-hmm. Oh, I've got it. <laughs> it's similar. It's okay. so similar that I've looked at it, and I'm probably POTS and not vasovagal. Basically, ah. vasovagal syncope is where all of your blood pressure will drop for no reason. Okay. And how is that different than they tested me? My blood pressure numbers didn't actually change, but I fainted. Wow. Um, so so how is that different than POTS? Like what, what would be the difference between vasovagal and POTS? Um, I think it, the difference is in, um, because POTS, you have the, uh, the racing heartbeat. And the palpitations. Sorry, I have. Uh, if you're hearing any whining on this uh, track, it's because my shepherd is being locked out of the house by my daughter who's trying to concentrate on her homeschool. And the shepherd is sitting right outside of my door going, why am I outside? Why? Why are you doing this to me? So please forget the small whining sounds in the background. I just wanted to check to make sure he wasn't trying to, like, break into the chicken coop. Yeah. 
But yeah, basically, I think, and I am not an authority on this. This is based on some very basic web research and what I can brain through the fog. But, um, but no, I think the main difference is that um, the reason the blood pressure changes is different. The, okay. The what's happening inside the body is different, but the outside it looks pretty much the same. Where you just kind of, all of a sudden, oh, I'm going to sleep now. Good night. (laughs) That's a big joke in my house because I have pots. So my body's reaction to, there's something that could hurt you, you should be frightened, is that my body shuts down and I faint. And it's like, this could be great for a bear attack, but for like zombie apocalypse things, I'm definitely the first one that's that's getting eaten. Like, (laughs) there is no way Darwin approved this biological problem because generally when like stuff is going down, you need to run instead of, I can't move, I'm going to faint now. (laughs) Like, my body's reaction to, like, a bear attack is like, let's sleep and see how it all works out. It should be fine. Yeah. (laughs) Mine seems to be more if I just, if I sit in the wrong position for too long, then I can, I can, it it starts and I'm like, if I don't change position in the next two minutes, I'm, I'm going to pass out. This sounds like a real problem if you're talking about having a regular kind of life like where you go to work somewhere and (laughs) people wait people do that yeah I've heard a rumor that there are people who are healthy enough and and hang on for a minute not only physically healthy enough but emotionally and psychologically healthy enough to adults and to go to an actual job five days a week and and work and 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 sit or stand and and they don't faint when they sit and stand and it's a rumor and I think it might be the same sort of thing as elves but I, I'm thinking this actually is something because my husband is one of those people who actually goes to work five days a week and can physically handle getting dressed in the morning and getting to a transportation device and getting to work 45 minutes later and then standing, sitting, standing, sitting for eight hours and then doing the whole reverse, come home and then make dinner and help clean the house and do homework because his wife does not always manage the getting out of bed part of that day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, mine, um, well, I'm, I'm sure we'll get into the uh, fun of living in a household with other people with chronic health problems. I, I'm in awe of you, by the way. Like, like I was reading through, yeah. and I'm like, I'm the only sick person, really. I mean, like, my kids show shades of this, but, you know, aside from, like, my extended family where there's other people who are sick, I'm the only one in this household, so everyone stepped it up, and, like, my kids do chores and clean the house and make dinner. My husband cleans the house and makes dinner. Whenever I am physically capable, I do those things, but everyone was able to step up having to also take care of someone else. I don't know. I I'm so impressed. Yeah, no. uh, I mean like the cleaning, my husband and I are really the only ones to do that. And our cleaning lady who is one of my favorite people (laughs) on the planet. That is amazing. So you have a whole bunch of things that, I, I'm guessing you're not one of the people who works 40 hours a week and is able to go out and, and um, adult. <laughs> I've never, I have never held a job for more than a year, except for when we ran our own business. Wow. And even then, we ended up having to close it because I couldn't put in the hours and it wouldn't, we couldn't get it profitable if we had to hire an employee. I know that feeling. Yeah, I was a photographer and I I ran my own business for 10 years and I had to shut it down because there was no way to hire the people for it. And I was way the too worst, sick to do it. <laughs> the worst thing that, that's come out of it all, honestly, for me is that like my hut, it was my husband's dream. It was what he wanted to do. And he made amazing products. And I, you know, I kind of, I had these uh, herbal remedies that I was making for myself and people asked me to start selling them. And I was like, okay, yeah, sure. And then we closed down the business and now people are asking me still for the tinctures. And they're like, they're like, my doctor wants information on this. He wants to sell them at his office. (sighs) I'm like, but I mean, I can do it. It's, you know, it, it making those takes way less foods (laughs) than anything else we were doing. 
it's so hard when you're like, this is your dream. It's actually happening and it's working. And you, um, it's not just whenever you're running a business and for anyone who has not, who's listening to this podcast, let me just explain really quickly. You are the most evil boss you will ever have in your life. I did work for years and years and years. I was actually capable of working through my twenties and in my thirties, I started my own business. I was the worst boss that I've ever had, and 80 hours a week was not even close to unheard of. 60 was a normal week, and um, to do that while you're sick, making the product, doing what you started the business to do is probably 10% of your life. Like, the rest of running a business is all the other stuff. Yeah. Like, running the social media account. Uh, Yeah, see, and I'm not even getting paid for this podcast, and it takes up so much of my life with the social media side of it, so anyone who wants to be really nice to this podcast who's a social media expert, hey, hit me up, and uh, if you guys want to take over the social media for this, please, that'd be great. That is most of my time. (laughs) And if I had the spoons, I would be (laughs) all over that. Oh, yeah, I mean, I, I, just, give you, I can give you tons of tools and tips oh, that no, I, I when I was doing it. But Believe me, I, I ran my business. I, I lived and worked in the Silicon Valley. I've got this town. Oh, it's just so yeah. much time. Yeah, I was, like, right over with, um, like, Menlo Park and all of that. It was just nuts. So, got really good at that. Hello? Hello? Wow, that was fun. <laughs> I'm sorry. I have. N- I, I don't even have an explanation. No worries. We will just continue from here. Totally good. <laughs> we'll stitch all the video together. It'll be fine. Um, so, yes, yeah, since we're the only people, you probably will be wondering why there's all these breaks, but I don't have the time or energy to edit. So, please forgive us. We were talking about the joys of running a business when you have chronic illness and um, how much fun it is to try to keep up on everything. So, you're home now with. Is it on disability or are you. Um, that's the plan. Okay. Um, because I haven't worked enough to get enough credits to qualify oh. for disability. And then yes. we keep seeing that because my husband pays the rent and I have a place to live, then I don't need it. Okay. So people around the world who have different Systems, And I know you and I are not always on the same page when it comes to politics, but this part is pretty true. There are other countries that you can actually, no matter what your work schedule was, there is like a lot of safety nets. And we don't have the safety nets here in the United States. Is, are we all good with that statement? Because <laughs> if you disagree oh, yeah. with me, please feel free. You, you do not have to agree with me on here, like at all. That's not a requirement. <laughs> Honestly, in general, I think most people in this country agree on the policy and the, you know, we need support for people who, who are in need. We agree on those things, but how important they are and, um, the nitty gritty of it. Yeah. You know, how do we fund it and things like that? You know, should it be done through the government or charity? Like those things are where the disagreements are happening. And if you follow me on social media, you know, I, I have a big mouth when it comes to this, but I am very respectful. I am never, ever disrespectful. As long as someone's comments are not um, invalidating my or someone else's existence, I am always respectful. And there is an issue with disability here in this country because I would not have been able to do it without my mother's help. If you are not, if you are sick to get through that paperwork And everything you have to do is insanity. And the amount of times you have to remember to call people and which people to call and who you talk to and keep track of all that, it's nuts and it's months. with a mental health issue on top of it. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. (laughs) Getting those letters, getting those people. I have had, like, I went down to apply once and I had someone who, and they weren't supposed to do this and they ended up getting in trouble for it. But um, they told me that I couldn't even apply. Wow. (laughs) And you know, if you have anxiety disorders, I mean, I have like, I just can't imagine like you're on the phone, you have to meet face to face, you have to go somewhere. For me, it's just an issue of going places because I was so sick when I applied for disability, even sitting up was making me pass out. So I almost passed out in the the disability office. But another thing just to know about this, if you're from a different country is while you're applying, you can't make money. So that it means that for six months to two years, you can't make money. So I it just 
if your oh. doll's on the floor going, well, there has to be some sort of safety net to make sure people don't go homeless. No, there's not. <laughs> there's not. No, actually, you're almost required to be. You're not. This is this is the reasons I've been denied. Um, because I had more than $2,000 in savings to live off of, you know, um, because someone else was providing me housing and food. Well, you know, like because my grandparents gave me a gift of money like it it's just the reasons you you can get denied they they really make it out to seem like if you are not homeless you can't qualify yeah it's um it's brutal and i i think we might be different state to state because none of those reasons applied to me but um, it was, I, I, my mom was working like 20 hours a week trying to get this through for me. It was crazy. And I just, I, the amount of empathy and sympathy I have for anyone who is trying to get through that system is huge because a lot of times you have to hire a lawyer. And if you are not making money for months or years, that's really hard to, even if they're not charging up front, that is still a big amount that's going to come out of the, the paycheck. So, Hey, if there's any disability lawyers who want to come on the show and talk to us about how this could go easier, please, please hit me up. I would love to talk to you guys. Um, so you've been doing this stuff since you were a teenager. Yeah. I, uh, let's see mental, well, mental health I've been dealing with since I was a child. Um, because it doesn't run through my family. It takes a nice, slow stroll and, and, you know, make sure to get in everywhere. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've been in therapy since I was seven. Wow. And yeah. so I feel free to talk or not talk about what you don't want to talk about. I had PTSD as a little kid, like, from the time I was, like, five on. And I know how disruptive that made me for school and how I was, like, known as, like, the kid who would either be daydreaming and not paying attention or would have panic attacks in school. And that was that was really awkward <laughs> when you're, like, a little kid and you're the weird one. <laughs> was that similar for you? Um. Honestly, the uh, the things that caused mine happened during my childhood um, and didn't really stop until my 20s. Oh, we are so similar. <laughs> yes. So I, um, yeah, I, I couldn't say how it affected me. I didn't accept that I had it until about a year ago. Wow. Okay. I, I, so I was just like, lucky. This is new for me. <laughs> My dad, is, uh, before he retired, was a therapist, a marriage and child family therapist. So it was like, it was pretty obvious or something that was definitely wrong there. <laughs> and then you were also a dancer. Is that right? Yes, of course. We're all dancers. Yeah. So like the eating disorder is just like jump right on in there. Like. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It's a um, it's a different world, and you were also mentioning that you had self medicated, and I think that's also another thread that runs through a lot of us who were sick kids, who just whether it was food or sex or drugs or alcohol or obsessive dancing, <laughs> I would actually put that under like oh, dancing yeah. became my drug. Like I would wake up at four thirty in the morning to start practicing just because it was a place where I think we're all just like when we're traumatized emotionally, physically, we're all looking for that space where our brain turns off. And whatever that is that turns our brains off, that's what our addiction is. And yeah, it was uh, dancing and cigarettes were my my major ones. <laughs> yeah, no dancing. I like I can remember. Um, I, I spent six months ish in a boarding school. Um, wow! It didn't work out. But um, I I had this wonderful dance teacher who really saved my life. And, um, she would let me come in any hours, whether wow. she had a class going, well, like I had a key to the studio. So I could go to, down there by myself in the middle of the night. It didn't matter. And, uh, use the studio and dance and work on choreography. And cause I was on crutches most of the time. Um, <laughs> oh. she would let, she let me choreograph a lot of the dances that's really, amazing. Uh, you know, the less advanced classes. I still do head choreography whenever I hear a song. I just, like, plan the whole thing out whenever. <laughs> oh, my God, me too. It, it drives me crazy. <laughs> like, oh, I know like, exactly. I want to do this. Like, and even worse, like, I know someone who's able-bodied and has dance experience. And so there's this tiny bit of me that wants to teach it to her and film it. 
YouTube channel. That is the ultimate YouTube channel, right? I would be there for it. <laughs> I know, but I know myself. Like, I was going to film. I, I got all dressed up. I was going to film today before this. I still don't have the equipment set up. This isn't even the equipment I was planning on using. Like... <laughs> Well, I I even, like, brushed my hair for you, and I put on, like, enough makeup so that I didn't look completely dead, but I, I yeah. <laughs> this is effort. <laughs> this is massive effort today. I mean, it was just the whole, this is my dog's nose. If you're watching on YouTube and you're, like, wondering what's in my armpit, my wolf decided to come in today and say hello to everyone. Oh, I'm not going to do that, but, yes, the wolf is here. Like, the weird nose is my, <laughs> my giant um, dire wolf here. Who is the whiniest, most pitiful thing ever, and I love him to death. Uh, anyway, oh. sorry. He's just um, very, like, I thought my kids would be the ones who would need my attention, but nope, nope, it is the oh, dogs. No, <laughs> no my, my dog's the same way. She's disappeared. I don't know where she is. <laughs> I bet, you know, it's it's the whole thing, like, even to be de- doing things like this, where it's like, okay, we're going to do an interview. It's in our house. How, how hard could that be? And oh. when you're <laughs> sick, it's like, okay. I've got to make sure I have enough time to get up, take all of my meds, make sure I've gotten through my meds enough that I know I could actually carry on a decent conversation. <laughs> and if it's going to be filmed, maybe I try to brush my hair, possibly. A bra would probably be a good idea to put on, which is not something that usually happens with the shoulder and rib dislocations. <laughs> like, <laughs> I cannot tell you how many times I've had to leave the house without a bra because I'm like, that's just not something my arms can do. <laughs> I just just pretend you're one of those like super hippie girls and you just you don't wear them. I mean, I do have the granola crunching look to me. Makeup is almost yeah. never heard of. I have not done anything with my hair since I think my senior year of high school. So it's the same hairstyle. <laughs> and we will not even go into how many decades ago that was. <laughs> Honestly, I have the same cut that I've had since middle school pretty much. <laughs> You know, if it works for you, you just, like, I look at Pinterest, I'm like, oh, I would love to do that half-shaved head thing, or, like, oh, the hair colors with all the blues, that's beautiful mermaid hair, and I'm like, you know what? That looks great on them. It's wonderful. I will just appreciate their beauty and just go with, you know what? I am a Bay Area granola crunchy girl, and that's my beauty. It's Birkenstocks and jeans and a t-shirt if you're lucky. Otherwise, it sweats. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I would love to try that. (laughs) But then I think about, okay, what would it take to go from that to where I am now? What would it take to bring it back? Yeah, well, and then there's maintenance. And I'm like, first off, just sitting in that salon chair, the last time I did that, I almost passed out twice on the poor girl. And I don't don't feel... I have to go get mine done. Yeah, sorry. (laughs) Over a year, I need need the ends trimmed. (laughs) This is like down to my waist because I don't go. (laughs) it's not a choice this is not like hey I want to be Rapunzel I'm totally feeling tangled right now but um (laughs) this is not like some sort of aesthetic decision I used to have have, um a couple friends um different different friends at different places where I lived who would actually come to my house and cut my hair and my kids hair and everything. They would do everything at my house for me. Oh, man, and that's my wonderful. Kids never been to a hair salon. They have that in an app out here, of course, because we're a Silicon Valley area. Everything's an app. Um, but I'm not going to pay that much money for <laughs> Like, I just don't, I don't think I care enough anymore to actually, when I was working, I cared and I spent the money. I went to the salon and had like the blonde hair and um, I had the same hairstyles forever. And when I got really sick and was using a cane, the last time she saw me, she was like, it was just kind of sad because she also ran her own business. We were about the same age and she just didn't know how to process. Like you can get sidelined through no fault of your own. Like, and she just couldn't figure out what to say to me, except, Oh my God, your life must be a living hell. I'm like, wow, that's not the salon talk I was hoping for. I thought we'd talk about like Brad and Angelina's breakup or like, I don't know, literally anything other than like you feeling extreme pity for me, like could have been great. <laughs> yeah. And honestly, I, when people start pitying me, I'm like, you know what? I have enough pity. <laughs> I don't need yours. Seriously, like, I, I I feel enough for myself. Like, I've got enough self-pity going down. <laughs> and um, I, yeah, it's it's hard because, like, I don't have the energy to make someone else feel better about my condition. Like, I just don't yeah. have it in me to, like, pet someone behind the ears and, like, 
explain to them how fucking inspiring I am or something or like try to make them feel better about like that this could possibly happen to them. Like I just don't have the energy to like emotionally babysit everyone. Yeah. Well, why do you think I, I, one of the reasons why I always look so fancy. You do look fancy. <laughs> do you like my tiara today? This is my current favorite. Freaking dying over it. I like, where do I get one? <laughs> I don't think it would work uh, with my NaNoWriMo sweatshirt, but I, I am here for it. Okay. Uh, you live in, you live in, uh, Southern California, right? Oh God, no, 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 no. I'm Northern. And Hey, no shade. My Southern California listeners. Um, I tried, I lived in Orange County for all of nine months. I am not an Orange County girl. Um, blessed be, uh, good job. Everyone who can handle that much sun. I went tearing my tail back up to the Bay area. It's not, it's too bright and sunny. (laughs) I don't like, I can't, I can't. For some reason, all of California, like in my head, it's just, it, it's all, it, it's like, where? <laughs> no, I hear you. We are like the ridiculous state. I think the only state bigger than us is Texas. Um, but our state is insane. Like nothing should be this big and governed by one group. It is, we are having like, like right after the, um, we are, we will not go into 2016, I promise, except just about California was like the next thing that happened was there was this major movement to split California in half of like two states. And I was like, you know, I've heard of worse ideas. I, <laughs> I, I don't, I'm that. not there was, for it, but I there are worse plans. Looking at the numbers and going, that's not going to work. No. Because, yeah. It's very politically diverse, <laughs> but they don't live in separate areas. New no. and people think of like California as like either San Francisco or LA, and those are two very small little areas of the Bay Area. And there's massive tracts of like farmland, agriculture. Like there's so much that goes on. I love the state. Please, under like the only reason I'd move is I need it colder, and I would love to move up to Washington where it's raining and cold. I like that's my dream is to get to the rain and the cold as quick as possible. <laughs> I wish I could do it. I love that kind of weather, like emotionally and, and <laughs> seriously, I really connect to it. Yeah. Like I'm always I've always really connected to the rain. And I can't take it, so I live in Florida where it's hot all the time. Oh my god. I'm <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just feeling for you because my uh, my family as the good Jewish New Yorkers moved, did the the migration to Boca Raton and I had to visit there a few times and Anyone with a heart issue who can handle that kind of humidity, I bow down. Um, I am so sorry. Oh, my God. I walked out the plane and just was ready to pass out in my parents' arms. Like, that was just nothing I could handle with the weather. Honestly, I have so much trouble staying hydrated. Like, I went I went to Texas once in the summer. <laughs> I spent one day going around and spending time with family. And a week and a half until I went home laid out on the couch because I had gotten so dehydrated. I had ended up in the hospital in 24 hours. Oh my God. <laughs> like I need the humid air. I, I have to have it. <laughs> wow. I, yeah. Florida was not my jam. I <laughs> could not well, I do it. In Alabama. In Alabama. Wow. I mean, those are places I would love to visit, but I would have to time it for the fall or like, Oh, the that's spring. like spring. <laughs> That's like when I go to England, I, I time it very carefully to be like at the beginning of summer or the beginning of fall. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to trying to get my husband they, to move us over to they England. They don't have air conditioners. That's so. problematic. Yeah. Yeah, we don't either in California. Unless you go to certain areas of California, no house has an air. Like in in regular areas, we don't have them. In if you go out to Fresno or like even out to Pleasanton or Livermore, there's air conditioners. But like if you're living near the bay, they it, you know it almost never would have one in a house, which is frustrating. I would love an air conditioner for like the two months where it gets up to like 110, and I'm like, <laughs> escape, escape. Whoa! So here's my big. Uh, I, we're going so far off topic, which is way fun, I know. and we will go into Doctor I Who to go way a, off topic. A list. <laughs> so this is where, that. like, my my co-host Kiros, he was um, left the show for a little bit to take care of some family stuff. He would come in when we'd have we have panels where we'd discuss things like sex and disability, and he'd be like, "Okay, Monica, here is the list of what we're going to talk about," and I just start cackling maniacally at him. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> sure, that's cute. We'll try it. <laughs> we'll see how far that goes. But well, for my little like about um we kind of touched on my fibro. Yes. Um just the basics. It I started having pain when I was at that boarding school um when I was 15 and it got progressively uh, worse, but by the time I was 16, everyone decided that I was faking it. And so it was explain what the, for people who don't yeah. have fibromyalgia, explain what the, how that presents for you so that they understand like what you're, because like fibro is hard because there's no real test for it except for like the pressure point test. And physically you don't have any physical symptoms like that show up in a, you don't present with anything in the ER. You just walk in looking like this or like that in the ER going, Oh my God, I'm dying. So uh, can you explain like how it presents for you? So people who don't have it understand what, what you were dealing with. Um, well, mine, um, started out a little weird cause usually it starts as kind of an all over thing and mine started in one joint. And then by the end of a year, it was in all of my joints. Wow. And how did that feel? Was it like the, I'm going to be like the horrible pain doctor with Honestly, a stabby it shirt like throbbing <laughs> in my joint. Oh my it God. It feels like there is something in there that, that the tendons are getting caught on, that the bone is rubbing against that, you know, it, that's what it feels like. And then you have the muscle aches that come that just feel like the way I usually describe it is if you worked out and, and pushed yourself all the way to the limit and your muscles are so worn out and sore that you can barely move, I wake up like that. Wow. Yeah, I always did the flu analogy. Like if you had the flu, you're that weak and your muscles hurt that much and then like you got run over by – it's almost like if you've had a major car accident – when you wake up, like when you're uh, starting to move around like two or three days later, that's what's like almost all the time. <laughs> like, Oh, do you have the fun thing where if you're in a car accident, you have to go to the ER and get everything x-rayed because you can't tell if you're actually injured or not? Yes. Well, yes, I do. But I also have LR stainless. So I dislocate by yeah. pointing at something. I'm not kidding. Like someone actually was trying to take me a task for this on Twitter. Like, you should just use marijuana or why don't you just be more careful? And I was like, okay, so... True story. I rolled over in bed yesterday and I dislocated my rib and my tibia. So <laughs> this is just not, uh, it's not warm and fussy disorder. So when I get into car accidents, I get really banged up. Which is why this got moved to today. And yes. I, the word <laughs> just should not be used in relation to any health issue. Ever. Fair play. Fair play. Sorry. That's, that's the ableism talking. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and like you said, people say that you just need to do this. You just need to do that. You're and so right. Like, <laughs> even if that would help, it's not going to do it all by itself. No. Um, and trying to, I, you're not in a medical marijuana state, are you? Oh, yes, I am. Oh, you are awesome. So cool. Yeah, um, sitting right here next to me. Yay. Um, huge <laughs> fan of medical marijuana. It is not the be all and end all. Um, but it's super helpful and it's wonderful for my vertigo and my nausea. It's my go-to for vertigo and nausea. Um, but if you are one of the people who's like, Hey, why don't you just get off the opioids? Cause you're part of the problem. Like <laughs> seriously, you need to educate yourself really quickly on how much THC can stop pain. It can help a lot. And it does reduce 30% of the opioid deaths in States that have medical marijuana. It is helpful. It is not the be-all and end-all. There are plenty of us who that uh, marijuana is not going to stand up to hip dislocation. It just can't. Well, and I want to point out something that people don't talk about very often, which is that the mental effects of the THC <laughs> and the effect that that has on our already difficult brain fog compared to what happens when you take a lower dose opioid you know, Sorry, I'm like, just, I'm so here for this. Yes. And drive. I can't take THC and drive. I can't hmm. safely do that. Hmm. You know, like I can't brain. I can't do math when I've had THC. I can't pair it effectively when I had t like enough THC to heal the pain. If I had to just rely on that, 
I wouldn't be able to adult. <laughs> so this is being filmed right now while RuPaul's Drag Race All Stars Four is filming. So like half of my brain is being taken up with like everything you're saying, and I'm like retranslating it into RuPaul's speak. And um, so my apologies as I like to the yes, and I'm here for it because my vocabulary changes during RuPaul. Just a warning. Uh, <laughs> but you're right, oh, like. I can, I know exactly. My vocabulary changes depending on who I'm around, so. (laughs) Well, and then, you know, we just got through the doctor, so I was like, (laughs) season 11, and. uh, No spoilers, no spoilers. I have not seen the New Year's (gasps) special. Don't spoil it. Thank you for telling me that, and I was not going to spoil it for you, I swear. The only thing I will say was, oh my God, it was amazing. (laughs) Like, I know, I know that the Daleks are in it. My son has already seen it, Um, (laughs) and I've sat down, I have sat down three times to watch it without him. I can't watch it without my kid anymore. It just feels wrong. <laughs> so my son had the floppy hair during Matt Smith, and like he's the one who got us into it. <laughs> so yeah, the, it's really hard to to not have him around for for all of it. My daughter is hooked, and we just we have Doctor Who marathons at home. That is, I don't think that they understand. Capaldi did because I think one of his either his wife or a family member has pots, so he would speak out a lot for pots and. Um, I, I wish they knew like how important things like Doctor Who and Sherlock are for those of us who are really sick and we don't get out and to have like really intelligent, fun, amazing things that expand our minds that we can just go to over and over and over again. <laughs> and just like there's there's thousands of hours of Doctor Who. You can absolutely for a week just watch Doctor Who episodes and you don't. A week? I've had the last time I was um, bed bound, I had a friend who was bed bound as well. Oh, and we uh, we live very far apart from each other. We never see each other. We're actually not really friends anymore. Um, don't even, yeah, whatever. We'll leave uh, that one. We'll just walk away from it. <laughs> while we were going through that, um, Doctor Who was still on Netflix. Netflix, why? <laughs> uh, it's on Amazon Prime. I know, and I hate I hate Amazon, and I love Amazon. Um, but yes, no, I, I watched it on Amazon. Anyway, anyways, but no, we would um, we would get on Skype. And we would have Skype on half the screen and Doctor Who on the other half of the screen. And we would watch, we would time it so we were watching together. That's amazing. Like, whenever I hear people complaining about technology and wanting to go back to the good old days when people actually communicated, I'm like, what the fuck do you think we're all doing with technology? Facebook is one of the most valued companies in the world. It's because we're using it to communicate. And those of us who are sick, this is our only way to talk to people. Like, this is it. And honestly, I feel really torn by it because on the one hand, yeah, technology makes it so much easier to reach my friends. Like, I would not have my best friend in my life. She lives in England. um, And I live in Florida. So we wouldn't even know each other if it weren't for the Internet. Um but at the same time, the people who are nearby don't leave their houses. You know, they don't want to go out. They don't want to come over and have dinner. They don't want to come over for drinks or games or a party. Like, no one goes anywhere. Real, I, I have such an opposite experience. Like, that's interesting to hear because we have um, we have Sci-Fi Saturdays um, every once in a while where we have everyone come over and watch B-movies. And I, we have family coming over all the time for brunches or for dinners and things. I, I'm so sorry. That's your experience. That's awful. Well, you've probably been in your area longer than I have. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I, yes. <laughs> I've been Very in much. this general area. Um when did I move? Maybe five or six years. Wow. Yeah, because, like, my friends, I've had my friends since, like, my best friend who's coming over this weekend, we've been friends since we were one. Like, I, most of my friends are still, like, <laughs> I seem yeah, to hang I on to people. friends that are that old. Be warned, if you are my friend, you will be, like, kidnapped forever. <laughs> I just, I, and that's part of, that's part of the frustration with severe mental illness is it, it will steal your friends. It yeah. will destroy your friendships. You I know? absolutely hear you. I like I my my mental disorders are are small and tiny, um, but I, I did learn a lot of coping mechanisms, which is being funny and being entertaining. Yeah. So it, part of me wonders, like, what what my personality would be like if I did, wasn't so sick, where I feel like I have to sing for my supper all the time. 
And, like, it, I have to be really entertaining and really funny. Otherwise, people won't want to hang out with me because I'm so sick. And it's like, I wonder who I would be if I didn't have that need to to perform for everyone all the time. <laughs> like You'd all be Oprah, honey. Uh, I would. I would rule the world. <laughs> we would. We would. We are all. I have not met a Spoonie that was not a type A personality. Uh, how about type A with massive ADD? <laughs> And the inability to focus on a task long enough to make it perfect. <laughs> I know, but we want, we all want to. Yes. And we want to, we want to do everything all the time. <laughs> and we feel horrible when it's not perfect. Oh and, my God. You know, yes. A personalities with bodies that just completely disagree. <laughs> There's a writer, Patrick Rofa. Oh God, I'm going to mess up his name. And I, fucking love him I mean like I I go down YouTube rabbit holes because I'm a writer and I was I I was taught I was trained to teach English literature I am a total geek and nerd and I love him because I go to YouTube and I watch writers panels because I don't have the energy to do an MFA so I get the YouTube MFA (laughs) and he is wonderful but he's very honest about like his mental issues and one of the things he talks about is having like um, oh God, I forget how he phrased it. So please look him up. But the basic idea was, is he has this idea he could do literally anything in two weeks. Open a bookstore. Sure. That could happen in two weeks. Uh, finish a novel. I can totally do that in two weeks. I'm like, you are my spiritual brother. Oh my God. That's like my world. It's like someone mentions something. I'm like, oh yeah, that's, that's totally doable. That can be done in two weeks. And I have a whole plan for how it can be done and I could do it for a day. (laughs) And then I'm like, oh, that was an idea. Wasn't it? Yeah. I was going to do some, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I, I ran into that a lot. Like, I ran into that earlier today. I was like, oh, it'll only take me 15 minutes to set everything <laughs> up in the dining room where the lighting is perfect. And and and, and the coloring, you know, complements my skin and my hair and da-da-da. And no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's um, I feel like we get this kind of overreaching optimism when we're the sick of, like, if I really, and I think some of it might be that we're, we're used to really pushing ourselves way harder than anyone else pushes themselves. Like for yeah. you and I, when we're sick as kids, like I had Elder Stainless as a child. No one knew that. I was incredibly traumatized as a child. Very few people understood or knew that. And the ability to sit in a classroom for six hours with teachers who are very quick to think the worst of you, you get very used to, to doing way more than it's harder for you to do literally anything than anyone else. Like just getting up to go to the bathroom is going to be harder for you than another student. Turning in your homework is going to be like 15 times harder to near impossible for you than another student. And I think we all get used to just being like used to using superhuman strength to do small things. So we think like, Oh, well (laughs) I'm used to doing the impossible. (laughs) How much harder can opening a bookstore be? (laughs) I finally, I finally just in high school, it, especially um, the last year and then summer because I graduated early. So I went, I went to summer school two summers in a row so I could do that. But um, no, I finally just sat my teachers down and said, look, you can give me homework and I will look over it and I will do a couple of the problems in my head and make sure I understand it. And if I don't, I'll work on it, but I'm not doing homework. Like, do not expect me to turn in homework. Wow. <laughs> I do not care what grade you give me on the homework, but I am, don't, don't ask, don't, don't fight me on it, don't throw a fit, it's not happening. And I still, like, I, I, I could still get A's on all of the tests, so I still passed. That you is know? literally my son. I graduated <laughs> with the lowest GPA possible to graduate, but I graduated yeah, I, I'm right there with you. Well, part of it was I had um, I had to have two surgeries, and um, some of my teachers refused to give me my homework during my surgeries. And that look, yeah, I, I like that look. That my kid. And then I dealt with like psychotic levels of bullying my senior year, where I dropped I dropped out for a little while after a panic attack, um, and then I came back. Anyway, I graduated with like the lowest GPA ever, and then I went to college thinking I was stupid, and. 
in college, you don't have to take six classes a day and you don't have to be in a class for six hours. You can, oh my God, get sleep, go into class at 10 a.m., only take two classes a day and different ones so your brain gets engaged. And then you have project-based work, which I live for. Like, that was yeah, awesome. No, I, the, the, I think I made it three months my first semester in, um, in college. Um, but before the, you know, the dance advisor said, you need to find another major. You, you can't dance. You cannot pass these classes physically. Wow. Yeah. I, I don't think that people understand what that feels like unless you've gone through it, where you have a dream, you've worked hard for it. And then you're told, I, I sorry, I was going to be a dance teacher slash choreographer. I knew even back then at six years old that I did not have what it took. I was never going to be a professional dancer. But my, my big dream was I wanted to be a dance teacher and choreographer. And later that turned into I wanted to be the next Bob Fosse. Ah, uh, Fosse. No. Oh, he revolutionized the dance world yes. by leaning in to his disabilities. There, uh, so people, I love I mean, people. Um, I, I use a wheelchair a lot of times, but um, I think people think that if you use a wheelchair, it's just your legs that aren't working. And it totally depends. Sometimes I can walk and I can't move my arms sometimes, you know. So people are always like, well, there's this wheelchairs dance companies. You should totally go do it. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> let me just give you a quick moment on I dislocate. It's not like I was in a car accident or I had a, a hip thing. It, this is like, there's different levels of abilities and that there are certain people who can count on certain parts of their joints to work. That's not me, but I get really jealous. And I watch, so you think you can dance all through the summer and <sighs> sigh a lot. I had to stop watching because every commercial break, I would get up and start dancing and then I'd hurt myself. <laughs> yes, we, we definitely are alike. <laughs> My daughter's in dance now, so I, I love when I'm able to, like, go and watch her dance at her dance classes, but, and she, yeah, she's My son good. was going, was interested in dance uh, when he was younger, but now he is all about acting. He wants to play the doctor when he grows up. Oh, oh. He, he his idol is David Tennant. Also. I, shouldn't all of our idols be David Tennant? The doctor I mean. when he grew up. Sorry, what? I, I was talking over you. I'm horrible. What? <laughs> oh, no, D David Tennant was the same way when he was a kid. His yes. dream was to play the doctor. I remember him talking. I watched all the David Tennant interviews, too. And I don't know if you're into theater at all, but he and um, Catherine Tate, the Donna from, from <gasps> Doctor Who, they did a Shakespeare play together. Um, oh, my gosh. I wrote five papers on this, and now I'm blanking on the name of it. Much Ado About Nothing. Yes, yes, yes. I haven't seen it. I oh, haven't seen it. It's on YouTube for free. Today. I know. I just, I, I, it's so good. I'm like, Oh, I have to look that up. And then I forget. Okay. But if, <laughs> for everyone listening to this, if, if you're thinking Shakespeare is like boring or dull or eh, this is the best. It is so good. And they take, it takes place in the eighties. They have it all done in like 1980s fashion with the hair and the puff sleeves. So perfect good. for that one. I did, um, I did a version in high school. I did a version of Hamlet at our school that was set in a techno dance club. I, I love Shakespeare adaptations. They're some of my favorite things ever. <laughs> and I, I used to I used to do uh, forensics and debate team. And I actually won an, uh, a few very small awards for um, doing pieces out of Taming of the Shrew. And I actually, I actually got told by one of the teachers, okay, it's clear you don't understand how dirty this joke is. Let me explain it to you, and then you need to leave it out if you do it again, <laughs> because you can't say that in a school. Like, Shakespeare. <laughs> uh, people do not, like, you just need a Shakespeare to English dictionary, and they have them. I have them all through graduate school. This is, like, my most worn copy of anything it was, like, in graduate school, my Shakespeare to English dictionary. But even the titles are hilarious. Much Ado About Nothing was a very dirty joke. And uh, go ahead and look it up. It's it's pretty funny. Um, but it's also, like, I feel like Shakespeare is one of the first feminists, like, literary uh, feminists, it, like, at that time. It's true. It's, it's, it's very feminist, and it is so 
filthy. Yes. I really like people do not give us enough credit. This is fantastic. And if you want the modern day version of this, go for Oscar Wilde or Noel Coward. Wonderful, hilarious, and the language is a little easier to take. <laughs> but it's it's so funny because I see like you are not the first Spoonie I met who's like Doctor Who fanatic. Like I feel like we live in a fantasy world where things are possible. It's kind of like me with tech. I am a tech geek. I love technology. I'm on like every science blog, like every tech blog. I am fascinated because it's my hope. So I watch sci-fi and fantasy because it's my hope. Like, I feel like we're all like really hooked into these things going, you know, like what we were talking about Amazon before and Amazon prime, I have huge issues with how Amazon treats its employees. If I was remotely healthy, I would be avoiding Amazon like the plague. But I feel like those of us who are sick, we're in this double bind where we want to do certain things a certain way, but it would be cutting off our own arms. Like, (laughs) Yeah, I mean, as much as possible, I try to I try to do things like um, order groceries and things from Publix and have them delivered. Which, yeah, y'all don't have Publix, and I am so sorry for everyone else. Did you just see my blank stare? Of huh? Doesn't live in Florida because Publix is amazing and they treat their employees so well. We have Costco, and they treat their employees really well. Totally different. It's basically just a regular grocery store. Okay, yeah, we don't we have Safeway, but <laughs> yeah, it's it's a regular grocery store, but you will never find a grocery store where people are the work, people working there are happier. That is uh, sorry, I put my hands in my pockets and pop my my elbow. Um, well, so yeah, I was gonna say you you look kind of like you did something <laughs> <laughs> that the grayish cast to the face with the eyebrows up to my yeah it's been it, this is actually my second dislocation through this talk so i feel <laughs> like I'm, I'm managing very well <laughs> why hey, what could possibly yeah, be wrong i didn't, I didn't even say anything <laughs> <laughs> And poor Kira, he'd be sitting right across the, and he was a paramedic, and he'd be sitting like right across the table from where we were doing our panels, and like I just put my foot up, and there was a loud crack, and my tibia would be sticking in from my kneecap. He's like, "Do we need to stop? <laughs> Shock will keep me going for at least another half hour." Yeah. So for you, well, I'm like that, we are so good the- at going off topic, but how did um, how did you get through? I just want to think, like as a kid, like. Especially with fibromyalgia, and you're talking about like your, your family going, "Well, you're fine. What's wrong with you?" And you know, my parents have felt really bad when I finally got diagnosed with everything I had, and the the doctors were explaining that this was something I've been going through forever, and they were felt horrible because like they just thought that I was a hypochondriac and that I wasn't good at life because I'd have panic attacks, which were actually POTS attacks. And, um, and panic attacks will be fair. Absolutely. Um, but <laughs> the pots does not help. How did you, how did you get through without the, you know, do people think like, well, when you're a kid, you have your parents that are there for you and to help you with things. How did you get through when it sounds like your family was actually a hindrance? No shade to the families, by the way, because when you don't know, you don't know. You just go with what you know. But how, how did you handle? Um, I had a lot of friends who... Probably weren't the best people to be around, but they understood hmm. that anyone else. Like, they, they understood parents not believing them. They understood parents treating you as, you know, a liar and a cheat and a, and a horrible person. They understood that. And, um, you know, there was that. And then just lots of, of isolating myself. And, you know, I read a lot of books. I watched a lot of TV. I have a <clears throat> sleep disorder called delayed sleep phase syndrome, um, which actually we later found out runs in the family. Isn't it great when we can help diagnose the whole family? Yeah, no. Um, yeah. Uh, two of my relatives have fibro. One of them accepts it. One of them insists that it's not a real thing and fired the doctor who diagnosed her. Oh. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, we all have our process. <laughs> so for I'm just making a point. You I? Were, I know we're we're both in brain fog, and I'm I'm heavily medicated right now. So we I think we're doing great. I give us a full like solid B plus on this. <laughs> we are almost at an hour. Oh, go ahead. You just I, remember. Go oh, ahead. God, so many things we wanted to go over. Oh, but um, no, just just lots of losing myself in in um reading and listening to things and redecorating. I would, 
I would stay up all night and redecorate. Hi, child in the background. Is there a child in the background? There is a child in the background. Yes, welcome to my world. There is no hiding that I am a <laughs> child in the background can go away now and work on her homework because this is all going to be on the air, little one. <laughs> I'm not editing this out. <laughs> <laughs> I do not have the energy for that kind of thing. <laughs> Welcome oh. to the world of trying to do stuff at home with kids. <laughs> it is what it is. Yeah. Um, but let's see. There, there were some things that I really wanted to talk about. And, of course, we're, we're at an hour. <laughs> and we haven't even gotten into the thing that I most want to talk about because it's the I, I feel like it's one of the most unique things about my experience. Go for it. We can go a little long. You just um, have to forgive us. I mean, living in a household with multiple people with. Oh, you know what? Here's what I'm going to suggest. Let's do this as a panel. Let's come back and oh. talk about this one as a panel. And because that's a that's an hour right there. That's yeah. definitely an hour. And I definitely I want to like delve into that. <laughs> deeply. You'll have to explain to me what you mean by do it as a panel. Oh, as so. a panel. So um, I do this a lot where uh, people have more to talk about. And they're like, we didn't cover this. I get this email almost every time we didn't cover this. I really want to talk about this. And it's like, wow, that's actually a really good thing to talk about. Um, but that seems like something we should just focus on by itself rather than your disorders and what you're dealing with. That's a whole yeah. other issue that has nothing to do specifically with you. That's saying that a lot of people we don't play the stripper music i'm just getting overheated right now um that but, looks exactly like my nightgown does it uh, that that it looks exactly like the nightgown i had on this is not a nightgown this is actually a tank top um we are in summer basically in january in northern california it is like 70 degrees i'm burning up it's it, awful it, I can't, my body can't figure out what's going on because one day it's like, we'll be lucky to hit 50 and the next day it's 80. Yeah, no, my plants are so confused. All of my plants are like, the fuck? Like, like, dudes, I hear you. I hear you. It's awful. I'm sorry. We're, ah, don't know what to do. Um, Yeah, so panel B, you just come back. We talk about that one specific issue and that issue and we just sort of like go through that. We might invite some other people to come on for that. Um, but I'm always looking for good panel ideas. So that's a, that's one of the best ones. <laughs> so is there anything you want to plug before you head off? Is there any, um, by the way, go to show notes, always go to show notes. I always link everything up. So if you're wondering what some of these things are, they are linked. Um, I will even put the Doctor Who episode, <laughs> I will even put David Tennant's uh, Much Ado About Nothing linked in there because that is the best, like, four hours you will spend. Um, you have you- you have to put the um their their best scene ever together, him and Catherine Tate in her Aren't they her, all scenes? Her her <laughs> special or what, what was it? Her variety show. <gasps> oh my god. Yes. I love her variety show. <laughs> we'll we'll link up some I'm stuff for you. And um we're I, gonna link your YouTube channel on there as well. So is there yeah, anything else that we want to just like run through? I have, I have a YouTube channel and an Instagram. Those are the places that um, are, are usually the best to find me. Um, and I try to focus on um, the importance of recognizing our value as women. You know, that is that is why I wear one of these every day is because, you know, we, we've said for generations that, you know, the man is, is the king of the castle. I'm sorry. I am the queen of the palace, <laughs> and I am in charge in these four in these four walls. You know, and that's that's generally how it is, especially if you're a stay-at-home spouse or parent. You know, it's you you rule, and wow. I don't rule anything. If you can't tell, I can't keep my kids out. I can't keep my dogs quiet. I rule nothing. <laughs> But no, like even even you, you know, yeah, you you may be you may be delegating from bed, but um, you know what needs to be done. You know what chores need to happen. You know, and we're still expected to, no matter how sick we are, we are still expected to do that. You know, a friend of mine just sent me over this amazing thing that I was like, "You are everything right now." I never even considered that, but she had this whole thing about the the weight of delegation. Because she's like, my husband will jump to do something if I ask him. The problem is I have to now figure out, like, what needs to get done and ask. Like, you saw that you walked past dishes. <laughs> what did you think was going to happen to them? <laughs> like, and that, oh, you have to do the prioritizing for them. 
Yeah, oh, or, or like, sorry, this is the other beast. Um, I, this one is desperate for attention as well. The door got left open, so everyone's in here. Everyone, yay! Every, um, but it's also a matter of like, well, I'm trying to figure out. Well, you did this chore, and you did that chore. What about this? It's just too much to even like think about. <laughs> And and you have to think about how much have they worked today? Yeah. And do they need a break? Yeah. I like I'm not I'm I'm the boss. I'm not the manager. (laughs) It's too much too much emotional labor. I am so done. And it looks like Skype has decided we are done as well. So I am gonna say thank you so much for being on. I really appreciate it. And please tune in next week to Invisible Not Broken. I don't know which which episode we are going to have so it'll be a surprise so until next week um oh yes and please share be kind share say something embarrassingly nice about us on social media share this episode to someone that you think might have any of these conditions or that maybe you have these conditions and you would like someone to understand them better and uh please keep sharing us we really appreciate it It means a lot um so until next week be kind be gentle and be a badass and i'm gonna go and fix my elbow now